All right. So I'm entitled the lesson tonight. Uh, let me get my notes over here. Excuse me. How to be rich in God's eyes. I was actually doing a word study on the word rich and riches. So this is sort of the outcome of it. I wanted to get God's perspective on rich and riches. And so as I made my outline and printed it all up, I realized that probably this will be a, maybe a Sunday or two to get through. I don't probably, I don't want to rush all of this and get, try to do the whole outline tonight. Because as I was studying this afternoon for point number one, I thought of a lot, a lot of other references and things I want to think about and say and cover. So uh, maybe we'll just be content to engage in point number one tonight and we'll spend a couple of Sundays or whatever it takes to get through this. So how does, how does one become rich in God's eyes? And we're not talking about how to become rich materially necessarily or how to have a lot of worldly goods. Well, that's not wrong per se in itself to have material wealth. But how does God, what does it take for God to look at us and God to say, wow, that, that person is rich? So let's consider this tonight. So, point number one is simply avoid greed and the love of money. So, greed is simply that insatiable desire for more. We, we, you're never content. No matter how much you have, enough is never enough. You always want more and more and more. So uh, Jesus tells us to avoid greed, and also the Apostle Paul says to avoid the love of money. So if you will, let's go look at the first passage here, Luke 12. It's actually the parable of the rich fool. So let's spend a little time just reading this uh, uh, story given to us by Jesus and thinking about it. And I do have some cross-references that we can look at. So this is Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. And maybe what I should do first is just read, read the parable right through from verse 13 to 21. This is Luke chapter 12 and verse 13. So feel free to follow along in your Bibles as we read this passage. This is Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 13. Luke 12 and verse 13. Then one from the crowd said to him, that is to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. We're in Luke chapter 12 tonight, looking at the parable of the rich fool. So the first thing we notice is in verse 15, Jesus says, beware of covetousness. And what we learn there is a person's life is not to be assessed or evaluated or measured by the amount of your material goods. In other words, rich people aren't to feel that they're more important because they have more stuff. And poor people aren't supposed to feel like they're less important because they have less stuff. Jesus is trying to say, look at your worth, your self-worth, your identity is not based on how much stuff you have, how much stuff you own, or how much money you have in the bank. So that's an important point. Our self-worth, then, is what is it based on? Our worth and our significance is based on the fact that God has made us, we've been created in the image and the likeness of God, so that we can know God. 
So God has made us. We have significance just by virtue of the fact that God made us. And he made us in his, in his image and his likeness. We also have significance as believers because we have been redeemed by the shed blood of Christ. Such that Christ buys us, he owns us, he's claimed us for himself. So the Lord says to you and me, you're mine. So that's where our sense of significance comes from. It comes from God. It comes from the salvation of the Lord. So Jesus says clearly, your significance, your worth, your identity... Uh, is not to be judged or measured by material things. So then Jesus says, of course, after he said, beware of covetousness, and he's given this warning about measuring your life by material things, he speaks this parable of the rich fool. So he had a farm, nothing wrong with having a farm, and, and, it, and he had a bumper crop. That particular year, the, the, the fields brought forth more than he could ever imagine. He harvested more than ever. So he, obviously this guy had a problem. Most people would be jumping up and down. All right, I got a bump of crop. I'll fill my barns. I'll sell some. I'll give some away. You know, it's, it, but for this guy, it was a problem. <laughs> Imagine having too much that it's a problem. <laughs> so <clears throat> he says uh, to himself, well, what shall I do? Because I don't have enough place to store my crops. That's the question he asks in verse 17. What shall I do? I don't have enough room to store my crops. So verse 18, he says, he thought to himself, and this is what he says, I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. Imagine that. I'm sort of using my sanctified imagination a little bit, but he calls them the bulldozers, and he levels all his buildings. Wow, oh, man, what's going on here? He levels all his buildings. He calls them the construction workers. Build all new buildings so I can store all my crops, and I'll put all my crops and all the grain there. And then notice what he's going to say. Verse 19. I'll say to my soul, soul, you have many goods stored away in all these barns. You have many goods stored up. So just uh, take your ease. Eat, drink, be merry. In other words, find your security in what those barns are filled with. Trust, trust in what's in those barns for your future. Now, of course, we're beginning to say, no, 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 he should be trusting in God for his future. And we say to ourselves, well, you know, he, he didn't have to level all those barns and build new ones. He could have filled the barns he had. He could have sold the rest of the grain. And he could have given some to the poor. Boy, that's a nice way to deal with it. So it doesn't sound like he was too wise in dealing with it. Like I say, for this guy, having too much grain was a problem. Most of us would have been jumping up and down, saying, well, this is, this is nice. We also notice in this parable that no time does he give thanks to God. At no time does he say, God, this bumper crop, this, this exceptionally yield, uh, this great harvest is a gift from you. He doesn't praise the Lord. He doesn't say thank you to God. He just tries to deal with it as a problem, and he tries to find security, what he stuffs in all those barns. So there's a warning here about finding a security in material things. As Christians, our security is in God. Our security is in the Lord Jesus Christ. We trust God the Father, and we trust his Son to take care of us, to provide, to sustain. And if God gives us food to eat, we give thanks to God. If God gives us a house to live in or an apartment to live in, we give thanks to God. If God gives us clothes to wear, we give thanks to God. If God gives us a job and the ability to work and to engage in that work, we give thanks to God. Because these are all blessings from God. So in verse 20, God said to him, you fool. This night your soul will be required of you, presumably he died. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So, all of a sudden, unexpectedly, this man passed away. And he was separated from all that grain and all that stuff that was stored away in those barns in which he was trusting. Now he stands face to face before God. Verse 21, Jesus says, so is he who lays up treasure. Notice now. He who lays up treasure for himself. Notice that little preposition, for himself. He lays up treasure. It's for himself. And is not rich toward God. So we have to ask ourselves the question then, well, what does it mean to be rich toward God? What does it mean to be rich in God's eyes? What do we need to do so God looks at us and says, you're rich? And I would submit to you, it's all about pleasing God. 
Notice that this rich fool, he laid up treasure for himself. He sought to please himself. He didn't please God. He never asked God, God, what would you have me to do with all this grain? How would you have me manage it for your glory? He never asked that. He simply did what he thought was right in his own eyes. He did it for himself, and he was not rich toward God. So I would suggest that to be rich toward God, we all need to do the things that please God. Now, having looked at this parable of the rich fool, let's read on a little bit. I don't have these, these other references on my outline. But if you will, notice the next section in the scripture. Notice the next section in uh, Luke chapter 12. It's the do not worry passage. Here Jesus talks about not worrying about what you're going to eat or drink or what you're going to uh, put on. Uh, he says in verse 23, life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. And by that, Jesus means, that's verse 23, by that, Jesus means the meaning of life, the purpose of life, the goal of life is more than just having food to eat and putting clothing in the body. Now, we need all those things. We need food. We need clothing. We need sustenance and so on. And God knows all that. And God is eager to provide for us. But that's not the meaning of life. So Jesus goes on and he encourages people to trust in the Lord because the Lord will provide for us. Then Jesus gets down to verse uh, 31. Verse 31. But Jesus says there, but seek the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. In other words, all the things we need will be added to us if we seek God's kingdom of what he wants us to do as our first priority. Verse 32 says, Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. That shows the generosity of God. We get the kingdom and all the blessings of the kingdom. So verse 33, this is what pleases God. Sell what you have, give alms. In other words, give charity. Provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old. A treasure in the heavens that does not fail. Where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So what do I regard as treasure? Well, I hope, hopefully my treasure is the Lord and the salvation he gives to me. Hopefully my treasure is the word of God and wanting to know God's word and wanting to live by it in my life. Now, back to verse 33 for a moment. I want to just mention charity. I believe charity pleases the Lord. Sharing what we have with others who are in need, I believe, pleases the Lord. And there Jesus says, sell what you have, give alms and give charity. Provide yourselves money bags which don't grow old. So I'm wondering, what is a money bag that doesn't grow old? <laughs> I'm not sure. I did a little reading on it this afternoon. But maybe a money bag that grows old is a money bag that you take and you stuff as much money into it as possible. And just let it sit and sit. You know how things tend to grow old and deteriorate just sitting? Like even cars, certain parts to a car. The car is never used. It just seems to deteriorate. So you just stuff as much money in the bag. Of course, in the ancient world, it would have been coins. You would have stuffed as much coins into the bag. Just let it sit there. So maybe Jesus is saying, uh, you know, have money bags which don't grow old because they don't have a lot of money in them. You put money in, but you take money out because you're giving it away. You're helping others. You put money in, you give it out. So perhaps that's the thought of a money bag that doesn't grow old. Now, following through this idea of sharing what we have and especially helping the poor, if you will, Luke, look at Luke chapter uh, 14, if you will, for a moment. Luke 14. Since we're in Luke and it's close by, uh, look at Luke 14 for a moment. Luke 14. And notice verse 12. Luke 14, verse 12. Here again, Jesus is teaching. Luke 14, verse 12. Then Jesus also said to him who invited him, when you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends and your brothers and your relatives, nor, nor your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. 
But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind. And you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For what shall be repaid, at, but for you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. So in other words, uh, we're, we're probably inclined to just uh, do nice things for those we already know, do nice things for those who may invite us back for dinner. You know, I invite you for dinner, you invite me for dinner, you know, you know how that goes. But Jesus says, no, 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 remember the poor. Remember those who cannot do anything to repay you whatsoever. Remember those people. And so I believe that pleases the Lord when we go out of our way to help those who cannot help us back in any way. So I just want to suggest that Jesus here talks about avoiding greed, avoiding avarice. You're not uh, to measure your life by your material possessions. And Jesus is trying to tell us, look it. Don't trust in material things. You need a certain amount to have your own needs met, but then let's be generous. Let's open up your heart and be willing to share. So let me just share a couple of cross-references here. We can go to Hebrews 13, if you will. Hebrews 13. And here's a cross-reference about a sharing and looking after others who need help but cannot repay us. So this is uh, Hebrews 13, if you want to follow along, feel free. Hebrews 13, and we'll look at verses 15 and 16. So that's Hebrews 13, and verses 15 and 16. All right, Hebrews 13, verse 15 says, Therefore, by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. <clears throat> and then I have another cross-reference. It's actually in the Old Testament. Psalm 145. So if you want to backtrack to Psalm 145, feel free. I'm giving you some cross-references. They're not on the outline. Uh, but I do want to look at these passages as they relate to what we're studying tonight. So Psalm 145, it's a great uh, a praise statement to God for all of his blessings. God is the great king who rules over all. So if you will, notice Psalm 145 and verse 14. I want us to notice something that God does, that we might appreciate what God does, and that we can try to imitate what God does. So in Psalm 145, notice verse 14. The Lord upholds all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look expectantly to you, and you, Lord, you give them their food in due season. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. I want you to notice verse 16. The psalm writer here, David, says, Lord, you open your hand. You open your hand, you give, and you provide, and you sustain every living thing. I'm glad God has an open hand. <laughs> and he opens his hand, and he provides, and he sustains us. He sustains all creation. He causes the sun to shine. He causes the crops to grow. And through work and labor, God allows us to have what we need. And so if God opens his hand, may God help me to open my hand and be willing to share and not squander every bit of wealth for myself. <clears throat> All right, before we go to 1 Timothy, which I think we'll have time for tonight, I also was thinking about verses, because I think it all relates to this, though, that work is commendable. God wants us to work. Work is a good thing. And i just like to cover a couple of passages here, and then we'll hopefully have time for 1 Timothy tonight. So, if you will, go to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4 and verse 28. While we don't want to be greedy, and we don't want to find our sense of worth in our material things, it is perfectly proper and God blesses those who do work and labor. So let's just look at a couple of passages here. So Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. 
And we'll look at verse 28. So we work, we labor. I want us to see that work and labor is honorable before God and it's God's will for our lives. So Ephesians 4 and verse 28. Here the Apostle Paul writes and says, Ephesians 4, verse 28. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, what working with his hands what is good that he may have something to give him who has need. So God wants us, rather than stealing, to have our needs met, the Lord wants us to go out and work. Work and do what is honorable. Choose an honorable path or an honorable profession so that we may not only have enough for our own needs to be met, but that we might have something to be able to share with others as well. And then, then let's go to 1 Thessalonians, if you will. If you're there in Ephesians, just go past Philippians, Colossians, and you're right there in 1 Thessalonians. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Thessalonians 4, and probably just to get the context, I need to mention verse 9. I'll start in verse 9. So this is 1 Thessalonians 4. And verse 9. Here the uh, Apostle Paul writes and he says, But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And indeed you do toward all the brethren who are in Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you may increase more and more. Now verse 11. That you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk properly toward those who are outside, and that you may lack nothing. So here the Apostle Paul is encouraging uh, Christians not to be busybody in other people's business, but rather lead a quiet life, go out, get a job, work with your own hands, that you would lack nothing and not have to be dependent on others, that you would lack nothing, and that's a good testimony, he says. And then just flip over the page to 2 Thessalonians, if you will. 2 Thessalonians, chapter 3. Here Paul so much as says the same thing, uh, a little different wording, and he brings up himself as an example to follow. So this is 1 Thessalonians, chapter, uh, excuse me, 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, chapter 3. Notice verse 7, if you will. Verse 7. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us as we were not disorderly among you. Nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. Not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. So Paul was trying to work, to labor, uh, perhaps on the side, he was a tent maker, he labored with his own hands to have to provide for his own needs so he wouldn't have to be dependent on others. So then verse 10, for even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. So uh, the Apostle Paul uh, commends work. Work is good, work is honorable. It's the Lord's path for us if we are able to do so. All right, so that's... Uh, I've said all of that because of Luke chapter 12. Lots of lessons to be learned there. And then let's just uh, finish up tonight with this passage, 1 Timothy. So if you will, just flip over the page, and you're right there in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. <clears throat> and here we'll begin in verse 6. So 1 Timothy chapter 6, and if you will, notice verse 6. So 1 Timothy 6, verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all 
kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So notice how the Apostle Paul uh, commends contentment, learning to be content. Now that doesn't mean we shouldn't work hard, it doesn't mean we shouldn't be industrious, but we be content with what you have. Give thanks to God for it. Praise his name for the ability to work and praise his name for what he has allowed you to earn and rejoice. He says, having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. And then he talks about the problem of desiring to be rich. If you make that your goal in life and your desire, then it doesn't seem like you're making doing God's will your desire. You can't serve God and you can't serve money. So let me get down to verse 11. Notice, excuse me, verse 10, I should say, verse 10. Now notice verse 10 doesn't say that money is the root of all kinds of evil. It says the love of money. In other words, it's your attitude towards money. It's the love of money that's the root of all kinds of evil. In other words, once you make your life's goal money, 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 wealth, possessions, then you run the danger of uh, engaging in all kinds of evil practices. And you and I know that people have even killed. They have killed. They have murdered because of their love for money. So number one tonight, avoid greed and the love of money. Yet we should recognize as good Christians that even the money that God allows us to have, it's ultimately a gift from him to be used in a manner that pleases him and honors him in every way. As Christians, I believe one of the uh, the great uh, virtues of being a Christian is gratitude, being thankful for all of God's blessings. So let's sort of, uh, sort of end it right here. Next week, I'd like us to look at uh, becoming rich in God's eyes by accepting God's grace in Christ. And we want to look at the passages next week that talk about how wealthy we are and how rich we are in our Lord Jesus Christ. So I hope that'll be a great encouragement to you. So we'll continue this study, how to be rich in God's eyes. And uh, let's just close in prayer. <clears throat> Lord God, we thank you for everything you have given to us. Everything we have is ultimately, Lord, a gift from you. Whether it's our health, our jobs, our income, the place where we live, every stick of furniture, every piece of clothing, every morsel of food we eat, the car we drive, or the transportation available to us, Lord, everything is a gift from you. So, Lord, fill our hearts with gratitude and help us to be thankful and help us to be content with such things as you have provided for us. And, Lord, we trust in you. Lord, you are our security. It's not all the crops or the stuff we have stored in the attic or the basement or even the bank account, Lord. It's you. You are our security, both for today and for tomorrow. So, Lord, bless us as we go forth, Lord. Help us to serve you. And I pray that every endeavor we engage in, whether it's the jobs we have for which we earn money or the things which we do for which we don't earn money, Lord, I pray that we would do everything as unto you, knowing that we serve the Lord Jesus Christ in all things. We ask for your blessing, we pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, so we'll continue this, Lord willing, next Sunday night.